Hello, everyone. This is Ginger Garner, and I am here with um, one of the wonderful authors from the book Integrative and Lifestyle Medicine and Physical Therapy. And I'm honored to be interviewing her today and spending a little bit of time with her. So before we get started, I'd like to introduce her, and then we're going to just jump right in. I'd like to welcome Dr. Ann Soderlin. She is a professor in physiotherapy with behavioral medicine profile at the School of Healthcare and Welfare in Sweden. She's an, also an affiliated professor at Arcadia, Arcada University of Applied Sciences in Helsinki, Finland. She is a leader of a multidisciplinary group, Be Me Health, which consists of 20 researchers. Her research area um, is focused on prevention, treatment, and evaluation of health problems from a behavioral medicine perspective in a physiotherapy framework. Her research focuses on something that's super important for us in PT, the individual's behavior and the ability to function in everyday life at different ages. She has more than 100 published scientific articles. Let that sink in for a moment. She is a member of the European Pain Federation Academy Board and also editor in chief for the European Journal of Physiotherapy. Welcome, Dr. Soderlund. Thank you. I'm so glad that you're here today. Um, before we get started, or as we get started, I always have this question on the forefront of my mind, and that is, in learning more about you, what brought you to physical therapy? Yeah, that is an interesting part. <clears throat> I was uh, 18 years old, and I just uh, heard the word physiotherapy, physical therapy. I was living in Finland that time, and uh, then I what is that? What do they do? And I went to search some uh, um, information through a, a study supervisor. And uh, she said, let's see what I was thinking about you when you were 15 year old. And then she looked at, okay, I recommended you to be a physiotherapist or physical therapist uh, that time, three years before. Oh, this is my thing. <laughs> I will be a physical therapist. <laughs> so that was it. Wow. You know, I've often said this about our um, our high schools and the way we choose our educational path in the United States. And and I wish that we had more specific kind of guidance and recommendations. And of course, it's been a few years since uh, I was in I was in high school, but um, the field of PT came up in my um, kind of realm also at that same time. But your story is so much more interesting in that um, a counselor, someone who was guiding you in that direction, mm -hmm. whereas for me, it was just, it was a classmate who was interested in physical therapy. I didn't even know it existed. Um, I thought law school was a good choice, <laughs> but, um, but I love your story. Um, and you've the the you know the duration of time that you have been in physical therapy is incredible and you know tell me how you have just seen things evolve and change because i'm sure there's been a number of things um that you could say oh that that's one of my favorite things about P being pt or this is a thing that i see that's challenging for us and i mean just give us a snapshot of your time in, in physiotherapy. How have things shifted? Yeah, that, that is an interesting uh, story, actually, too, because um, I um, I had my education uh, phys physical therapy program in Finland. And and um, but I think the Nordic countries had very similar um, programs that time. And uh, I remember uh, this was uh, 1978 uh, in Christmas time, and I remember our uh, um, what's it called vice chancellor. She said in our in the last uh, speak uh, talk to us that um, you go out there now and make yourself not you uh, so that you are not you know don't need be needed anymore. So make yourself not needed anymore. And that was kind of, um, it was a prevention. That was a preventional thought. And I, uh, then, then in, in the beginning of 80s, uh, there was 
obviously more money in the system, in healthcare system, because there was a lot of preven preventional programs uh, going on also in Finland, at least. But then the money disappeared in the 90s, somewhere there, so some end of 80s or 90s, beginning of 90s. And, and then we started to direct uh, all, nearly only to the people who were always, already sick. So 90s was not so much about that, what is in my so so deep in my heart that uh, that the prevent prevention of uh, lifestyle coaching and the prevention that it, it is so important thing absolutely it is and and i've spent a bit of time um it's one of my biggest passions is advocacy and making sure that that people have access to physical therapy and when we the united states is not um, a model <laughs> for that necessarily, but the Nordic countries have done so many wonderful things to pace themselves ahead of us in terms of prevention and wellness. And mm -hmm. then you mentioned in the '90s, kind of things shifting. How have what do things look like now? Um, you're in Sweden now, right? Yeah. So, what do things look like now in terms of prevention and wellness um, there? Yeah, the, the government is talking about quite a lot about prevention, but the, the money isn't there. So they, they just want to they just want to support and they just just want to identify the areas where we need to to be, be uh, much better to to prevent sickness and illness and uh, also different kinds of trauma, of course. But uh, there is the money is all the time going free research money and also in not maybe not so much in the education but at least research money is going to the not to the prevention area unfortunately very few projects uh, maybe one ten percent or nine percent or something gets money for for that kind of uh, things so are you finding that there um the levels of chronic non-communicable chronic disease and pain are also increasing it's maybe not similarly to the us or maybe um, is that's what what is happening there yeah they are increasing still increasing they have been increasing quite a lot maybe i think they have been increasing uh slowly in the beginning of 90s and then faster and faster so so that is so true so we're sharing similar struggles where our our healthcare systems you know it, i think at the end of the day our vision is to be aligned with wellness and prevention and behavior change but kind of where the rubber meets the road um it's not happening right. and i think that and we mentioned this and um this kind of takes us into your um chapter in the book and the overarching theme of the book which is trying to uh, take a full circle um, path back to integrative principles of lifestyle medicine principles to help people um, and practitioners. And the book is really about uh, physical therapists doing that, but the Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization all have the same, you know, impetus to press all healthcare providers to be screening mm -hmm. for these lifestyle medicine um, and lifestyle habits that we know contribute to chronic disease development uh, and pain. I know in the United States, um, we spend nearly twice as much on healthcare as any other nation, but we are, we rank among the last, <laughs> um, we are last among the 12 wealthiest nations in medical outcomes. So we need integrative and lifestyle medicine um, Sweden needs it, the world needs it. Um, you know, the United States um, tends to run a really poor track record on, on that kind of thing. So it, the book was, um, is, is timely. Um, how did you- Can I, can I say something? Mm -hmm. it, there, this, uh, this pandemic we had, it showed even more clearly that we need to do something. We need to do so much more in this area. Uh, smoking, um overweight uh, th these kind of uh, problems that are 
preventable if you, if there is a little bit more um, support from the government side, what I think. Right, absolutely. Our accessibility, we can do a lot to improve accessibility. And because there are so many of us as physiotherapists, I think that we can do a lot um, and we're pretty ideally suited because we can spend more time with our patients. Mm -hmm. We can talk to them about these interventions. So the, that leads me to this question. Um, how did you, what drew you into using integrative and lifestyle medicine? At what point did you, that it kind of click and you went, this, this is, we really need to be focusing here. I think it is based on my, on my original start from the end of the education, what the, what the vice chancellor said about make yourself not needed in the world. And they, and so I have, I have always, I have always been there somehow in not, not, um, not for example, uh, asking patients, uh, are you, are you, do, do you smoke or um, how much do you drink and what is your, what, what, did, what do you eat and do you, do you exercise? That is, we, we, we do always ask that, of course, but, but, um, but th there has always been, it's kind of, um, my bottom bottom plate <laughs> where I'm standing, uh, and then uh, it's you. Um, the more I know, the more I uh, uh, read about uh, health and and sickness, the more I acknowledge for myself and and others too uh, that uh, that these are so these are so important parts in everywhere where we work it it doesn't it doesn't need to be musculoskeletal pain or musculoskeletal problems it can be neurological problems it can be psy, uh, psychosomatic problems psych, psychiatric psychiatric problems everywhere this is everywhere and we we are so as you said we are so <clears throat> made for to help this to support this to coach to people to other place, not where they are. Right, meeting them where they are, which yeah. may mean picking um, the thing which is the easiest for them to start changing so it's not overwhelming for them. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing applies to physio and physical therapists trying to apply integrative and lifestyle medicine because for many of them, it might be a little scary concept, something that what if their school really didn't have um, a strong, you know, health promotion class or uh, because a, a lot of programs, all, all programs, I say, would probably have something, you know, in, in along the lines of that. But it might be an elective. It might not be a fully dedicated class to applying integrative and lifestyle medicine. So what do you think some of the biggest challenges or maybe the biggest challenge for our PTs are today? I think uh, one of one of the biggest challenges is to to heighten our um, our own self efficacy to to believe us uh, um, um, to, to believe that we can do it we can do this that we can we have the we have the tools there I think there is no physical therapist in the world who doesn't um, who doesn't uh, negotiate goals with the patient. And that is one of the behavior change techniques. But you need to be aware that uh, what you are doing, it is not just the goal setting. It is, it is more than that. So I, the, I, need, I think that one of the biggest challenges is to, to um, get the higher self-efficacy to do this thing to to um, talk with the patients about about uh, lifestyle um, problems and lifestyle uh, factors right and then and then also of course we need to we need to uh, send the patients further we we cannot do, i don't know how to do how to uh, support patients to to um, stop smoking or or uh, stop drinking. I don't know how to do. There are other best, other uh, people who can do that. But we need to ask the questions and then help them uh, to that kind of support. That's that's um, 
I want to pull out that one thing that you said, because if you if you're a student, if you're a student physical therapist listening, or even if you've been a practitioner for 10 years, and this is um, a shift of, of, of way of thinking and a practice for you, I think the very first thing is one of the things you said to reiterate is to just be prepared to screen for all of these things, hmm. screen for nutrition, stress management, physical activity, environmental influences, which includes smoking, tobacco cessation, and minimizing other harmful environmental pollutants like estrogen or endocrine disruptors, for example. Um, did I get everything in the list? <laughs> and relationships, focusing on yeah. uh, relationship. And that last one um, brings up another important point I wanted to draw out of what you said to emphasize, which is self-efficacy. And that applies to not just the improving patient self-efficacy, but believing, like you've mentioned, believing that we are able to deliver these services, mm -hmm. um, which might mean additional training. Maybe it means sticking your nose in the book for a little bit longer or a book for a little bit longer. Um, because in order to increase someone else's self-efficacy, I think you also have to believe in yourself and believe that you can too. And so in a way, practicing um, integrative and lifestyle medicine is a deeper form of self-care because it's not just something academic that you learn in a book. You're really learning to apply this stuff and it is the most efficacious if you're applying it to yourself first, kind of putting your own O2 mask on first and then it's easier to apply it. Um, and I, the research also shows that, well, our patients are more likely to listen to us if we are actually some sort of role model for yeah. them. Yeah, so true. Yeah. So with with speaking to those challenges, because we have two things there. One, healthcare providers, um, and you can speak to how physiotherapists feel, um, what burnout rates look like in Sweden. In the United States, we are crippled by a few things, um, student loans and debt, um, hybrid productivity requirements, so seeing more and more patients in less and less time with lower reimbursement, and then not having the funds to, if you want to start a health promotion program or a wellness-based program, the question is always, who's going to pay for that? So I think my question would be to you, um, and I would love to get your insight on um, the challenges faced in Sweden by physiotherapists, because um, in doing that, we you know we learn about the, you know the wicked the other wicked problems in the world and how to solve those. So, how do you think we can overcome or navigate the challenges that you see with PTs, either in Sweden or you know globally? Mm, that is a it is a big question. <laughs> yeah. Um, and. We could I start think, with some... um, yeah. Oh, I was just going to mention, um, even starting with something like behavior change or stress management, that that's one of the main areas where PTs perceived themselves, not the public necessarily, but PTs themselves perceived themselves to be less capable. Yeah. If you, but it, it that is that is also a question of um, in our in our education programs how do we define the stress what is stress if we are defining the stress the one of the stressors is uh, the is having pain for example we pts we are we are meeting pain patients yeah, at least in in uh, in sweden 80% of the patients what pts are meeting they are they have they are having pain musculoskeletal pain so that is a stressor that is a stressful situation to have pain just be aware um i don't i don't know maybe maybe we should do more in our education to uh, more in in a way that define these these um, uh, concepts that we are using so that we that that uh, for example uh, what to do with uh, with stress what is what is stress that we are not looking at it uh, that as no that is that is nothing for me that we are uh, that we could see behind it that it is not the it is not actually. It is not so complicated term at all. It is. 
everything. We have a lot of stressors around us uh, and in in uh, our daily daily lives. Um, everybody right. has it, and when, sometimes they are too high, and sometimes they are mm, normal level, and sometimes nothing. So I think that is uh, one thing that we need to we need to uh, maybe discuss more also. How do you see what is stress for you? What is stress for you? What do you? How do you see that? Right. And then Kelly, it, it's a, it's a, it, it will start a discuss. It will start to progress towards okay, what to do? Okay, every PT knows how to how to teach patient to relax, and that is one of the one <laughs> one of the treatments or mm -hmm. uh, management yeah. or stress. The big foundations. Yeah, I think that also in in the US, um, and this is not in the US, this is globally, Kelly McGonigal, um, who has her um, PhD, she did a TED talk, this was several years ago, and the slant that she took on stress was that she looked at research which tracked people, people's longevity, and their mortality was dependent on how they perceived stress. If they perceived stress as something that was going to break them, that was going to um, overcome them, then they were more likely to die earlier. But if they perceived stress as something that could make them stronger, in other words, instead of just distress, you stress, that it could build them up, that it could take them to a better place, that they actually had improved longevity, which I think the conversation could simply start with that is that you what is you stress what is what is distress in breaking down your question of what is stress and how do we know when we're practicing you know what we'd call grit or resilience how do we know when resilience is good or bad in ourselves and in, in our patients is a is a really good question because some of the things that we perceive as um, stress, oftentimes we could use things like cognitive behavioral therapy or ACT or ACT to reframe, you know, cognitively restructure how people are thinking about things. And of course, again, it comes right back to us again, because, you know, we want to reframe the way we think about things too. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's self-care and, um, and self-medicine at the highest degree. But I think that looking at how to deconstruct if I'm you know, hearing you correctly, and I completely agree with it, if we can deconstruct what people perceive and define as stress and guide them, you know, I, I'm not tell them, but guide them towards a, um, a, a manageable solution that sometimes it's just um, guiding them in a way that helps them find their own answers, which I think is, mm -hmm. is most effective and, um, it certainly is in the tobacco cessation literature of it, people are more likely to quit smoking if they come up with the reasons for why yeah. <laughs> versus and us think, telling them. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think I'm thinking about um, when we meet the patient and we are we are talking first time with the patient, we, we want to know why are you here and what, what is the problem and how do you see with the problem. If we are listening with, with the right uh, ears, uh, then you can you can find the stress, the stress um, co co the uh, the factors causing stress and also if the person is kind of uh, um, turn, turning emotionally uh, um, trying to emo emotionally manage it or or um, trying to manage it behavior uh, as I am trying to do that and I am trying to do that. And maybe the behavior strategies are not always uh, very good. Maybe they they should be um, formed to somewhere, some other way, more active or so. But but still, you can you can hear in the story when when you are meeting the patient that what the stressor is and how the patient uh, see sees to that, how how overwhelming it is. Mm -hmm. On my intake forms, I just include um, a stress a brief stress um, inventory. And I also ask them about time because stress and time management tend to go together. If P 
people feel like they don't have a lot of time, then their ability to manage that stress kind of falls off and then their stress radar, you know, on, on uh, the kind of ticks up from there. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I hear if I had to give it a percentage, I think in at least 40%, maybe even half of my patients, that's what rises to the top. Um, and we end up talking about how they're able to fit into their daily schedule, what I'm asking them to do. It could be stress management. Um, it could be something to do with pelvic health or whatnot. But when I circle back and say, let's break down your home program into a way that you can fit it into your life realistically, I always see like a, a look of relief, like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Because we're, we're trying to usher them towards that. It could be a small, tiny behavior change, right? Or mm. it could be a big one, but we get there the same way by making these little tiny steps towards. Yeah. And sometimes it's just acknowledging that our patient may only have five minutes to three times a day, maybe to do what we would like for them to do. And we have to, it's our job to figure out how we can fit it into their day, um, which that alone could lower their stress um, perception. Yeah. And that's, there the WHO has done a good work in their latest report about physical activity and, and sedentary behavior. Um, when they are talking about that every movement matters and the, and the, because the, the our patients doesn't really know that necessary at least maybe i don't, i don't think many of them knows that at every moment every time you go stairs at your home to the second floor it matters and then these uh, 5 minutes uh, uh, three times 5 minutes per day it is it is really good thing and it is not a little thing. It is a good thing what you do uh, for yourself. And that is, uh, that is um, really um, quite an effective uh, behavior change technique to, to, um, to, to see to that the patient um, also can, comes to the same, same uh, level to realize that, yes, this is a good thing. I, I cannot go to the gym for for one hour. There is no no way that I can put it in my in my daily life. But I can do five minutes there and five there and five there. Mm -hmm. And the importance of this, the importance of this also makes that the, these patients um, heightens their own self efficacy in uh, in handling their their life situation. Yeah, yeah especially when I, I will fully admit to them as well. Um, as a therapist, it's what I do for a living. I don't have a gym membership. I would not have time no. to go to the gym if I had a gym membership. And it's also, I think, good for some people to hear um, sometimes that not every personality is suited for particularly a gym membership. No. I, I heard Glennon Doyle say, um, she wrote the author, she's the author of Untamed. She wrote that, when she she hates gems because when she goes into a gem, it's just people shouting at her the whole time, <laughs> which feels really stressful. And I totally um, can feel that. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you're a solitary exerciser, you like a walk in the woods, a walk in nature, five minutes here, just like you said, five minutes there. The research overwhelmingly supports it. Counts. It all yeah. counts. And you no, know, you don't have to have. I, uh, a gym membership to to get fit that's for sure yeah if you had one thing to recommend one two or five things um uh, Anne wrote our orthopedics chapter in integrative and lifestyle medicine and physical therapy um in the text that can be found at optp.com um out of that orthopedics chapter if you could pick a few clinical pearls to share, what would be a few important things you'd want therapists to know? I would, uh, I would, uh, among the assessment methods, I would, I would go there and, and read them and then find my thing. This is okay, because PTs has also, they, they daily life in, in the working, working life is full of things. They, there is not so much time for for um, uh, start to implement new things. 
Okay, go there and find your thing. Ask that question or ask those two, three questions. And the second thing is to, okay, how about in the treatment management uh, part? There are two tables, one for how to increase uh, uh, self-efficacy. There are different ways to increase self-efficacy and it is not so complicated. But if you are doing it systematically and, and really know what you are doing when you are, when you are acting like that or, or giving the patients, showing the patient a group of people, group of other patients who are, who are doing exercise in the group and they are managing to do, okay, this person's self-efficacy heightens and uh, to, that, to see in them. And also the, the other table, which, uh, which shows how to, how, how to, how to use those, uh, those, those, um, what I call behavior change uh, techniques and that actually are normal things. Very many of those are normal things, what we are using, but we are not uh, using it uh, kind of, we, we are not, we are not aware when we are using feedback, for example, or, or this goal setting, what we were talking about, or, or um, having an a, um, exercise diary and then discussing that with patients. There, there are so many simple things, but, but being aware of what you are doing when you are using these things makes it more effective also because you, are, you, you should talk with the patient. This goal setting, this is about that. It, it makes that when we, are, when we are setting goals together, it makes that you, you will be, it will be easier for you to change your uh, situation, your behavior. So one assessment, two, three assessment questions, or one, at least one, and then these two tables, one for self-efficacy, increasing self-efficacy, and the other one uh, describing uh, behavior change strategies. Thank you. I don't Thank remember you. the page numbers, but maybe you. <laughs> yes, I do. I know. Yes, I do. I, I, my, the book is I across. Have them here. Oh, you do? <laughs> The table four, at least, is here on page 220, 230. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so make sure that you check those pages out. Um, the orthopedic chapter does a lovely, lovely job of overviewing these exact things that, um, that Anne has mentioned, because um, without a systematic way of approaching it, um, then it's hard to change course if, if you know, we're not documenting the techniques that we're using um, and we're not in approaching it um, in a, kind of a, a scaffolded way. So that chapter allows you to do that. Um, let's talk a, a bit to the, the general, you know, to everyone, to all of us who are trying to improve our lifestyle behaviors every single day. Um, what do you think is one or two things that people should really know about integrative and lifestyle medicine, if you had to give them a few tips? The, the first one is actually the one we were talking a little bit uh, earlier, uh, is that uh, every moment counts. Every, every moment of your body counts for your health. <clears throat> Think about that and, and let yourself get happy when you are just uh, walking to the next station or, or bus stop or whatever. Uh, let yourself be happy um, that you are achieving something. That is, that those are not little things. And then also that um, if you are, um, it depends uh, when, um, which kind of individual you are, but if you are an individual who, who likes to uh, keep track on your doings, they are so, uh, there are so many apps that helps to, to motivate you through that, well done. How about next time? Can, you, can we, can we uh, meet uh, tomorrow? The app, it is not, nobody is asking, but the app is asking. Can we meet tomorrow? And it is so uh, uh, motivating, at least for me, but uh, you need maybe be a certain kind of person to, to use this kind of, um, self-monitoring um, um, things. Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, the World Health Organization and the Physical Activity Guidelines have, um, which the last update was in 2018, I believe, um, 
that assured us that there was no minimum for physical activity to make a difference. And, you know, I, I wasn't an app user and then I got <laughs> an Apple watch for Christmas <laughs> and I'm charging it. Yes. Yeah. I'm charging it now. Cause it just died. And I have actually enjoyed, I would have not gone and bought one myself, but I have really enjoyed the tracking that it does and the little, you know, glitter and fairy dust, whatnot, that it throws up in the air when you've, you know, you've met your physical activity. Um, I do one for mindfulness for the day, for yoga, for horseback riding, whatever it is that, that I'm doing. So the mobile health apps really make a difference. I use yeah. those in my practice to monitor patients. It's to monitor all the lifestyle um, habits that we have. So yeah, no, no amount of physical activity is, um, is too small. Mm. And um, if you like that external motivation, then check out, and there are lots of free apps. Um, you don't have to buy an Apple watch, but uh, they are pretty fun. But um, there are many, many mobile apps that you can, uh, you can reach out to, to mm -hmm. see if you like them. Mm -hmm. um, I've been asking this question to kind of to wrap up because I love music. And um, so the question is, what song do you think represents physical therapy from your point of view? Tina Turner, the best. <laughs> I think we are the best. <laughs> and Simply it's the nearly, best. Nearly, not nearly the whole uh, uh, whole song is about us. There are some parts that are re not really matching, but but nearly I'm the whole. I'm gonna have to go. I'm gonna have to go listen to that. I'll, all no, I can remember really. right now is um, simply the best. Yeah. Better, better than, than anyone. All the rest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> better than anyone. Yeah. Anyone that I've ever met or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone yeah. I've ever met. Yeah. Simply the best. I have not heard that song. <laughs> I haven't heard that song in a long time. I'm gonna have to put that on my my move, get my exercise in playlist now. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sodalin. Thank you for being here. Thanks for spending this time with me. Um, is there an easy way someone can get in touch with you, a website or Instagram or anything yes, like that? Uh, yes, uh, our website, um, www.mdu.se. <laughs> Give it, to I'm me so, I'm sure. <laughs> Give it to me one more time. Give it to me one more time. Eve. Eve. The first letter of Eve. Okay. S -E, right. like Sweden. It is S Sweden. Dot S -E, yeah. That's right. For, uh, for Sweden. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you yeah. so much. Um, uh, have a lovely rest of your day and, um, we hope to see you soon in the future. Yeah, you too. Thank you for a nice discussion. This was very fun. Hope to meet you in future. Maybe. Oh, I hope so too. I hope so too.